Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to this PacTrans CSAT Region 10 Transportation Conference. Uh, I know today is uh, Friday and it's quite early in the morning. I certainly appreciate you making your time coming to join our uh, transportation conference. Um, maybe you all know uh, PacTrans Center located in the University of Washington. Um, we are kind of focusing on uh, addressing mobility challenges in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have been serving as the research engine for Region 10. Uh, following that particular objective, uh, you will see actually we have a lot of research projects done. Um, some of the research projects are multi-institutional. We have over 30 such projects. There are also a lot of university-based smaller projects. Uh, come out from these projects uh, we have a um, startup company from the University of Washington, you see that, maybe when you enter this hall, um, the AI vision. We have also another startup company uh, based on Oregon State University focusing on uh, geotechnical data. Uh, we also file the patents. Uh, you see a lot of posters there. Certainly, I hope you recognize our PIs if you see value for those research products and are waiting to carry them into practice, please talk to the PI and PacTrans still have the tech transfer money to support this kind of activity. And PacTrans also want to be the um, education base, um, education leader. Um, we set up our PacTrans Workforce Development Institute in 2020. We're ready to support the, the training needs. If you come on behalf of a transportation agency or a company, you see your training needs, please talk to us and we can help you. Um, also, we have been serving as the communication node. Uh, we offer this conference as a good platform for our researchers to know everybody. So I hope you set up a new connections and uh, also the potential collaboration so we could make our work practical and solving your problem in practice. Um, today I want to particularly appreciate this conference sponsors. Uh, we have four sponsors for this conference, uh, for this major, uh, major conference. There are also sponsors for the student conference tomorrow. Uh, they are Verizon, uh, Washington State Department of Transportation, AI Vision, and uh, Concord. Uh, thank, thank you very much, the sponsors. I just want to be brief, and I hope you will see we have uh, a very good program set up. Uh, speakers you know, from in and out of the region with a lot of experience. So I hope you will enjoy today's conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, by the way, I'm Yin Han Wang. I'm a professor at the University of Washington and also director of PacTrans. Now I would like to introduce my partner, um, Billy Corner, who is the director for the CSAT Center. CSAT is a center uh, for, transport, uh, for safety, equity in transportation. Uh, Billy is also associate director of PACTRANS. Billy, the floor is yours. Thank you, you and I. You know, this is kind of a special day for, for many of us. We haven't seen each other for three years or so now. And to be able to look out over this group and see the smiling faces, it's a wonderful thing. So enjoy each other's company over the next uh, uh, eight or 10 hours, uh, and certainly enjoy uh, the opportunities that you will have to talk to each other, to learn from each other, and to uh, listen to some of the work that we have been doing, both in PACTRANS and in CSET. CSET is really aimed at rural, America, especially in the Northwest, and primarily uh, we've been working a lot with the tribal groups in order to help them ensure that their transportation systems are safe and certainly efficient as, as part of that. One of the things that we've been able to do uh, for the first time is gather the data. A lot of our effort over the last five years is gathering the data to be able to address some of those issues and to identify what those issues are. For example, uh, we found that um, 
about 25% of all the crashes uh, in, in Alaska for uh, uh, all-terrain vehicles occur on or about the road, uh, which is really surprising. You think of them as off-road vehicles, but people are starting to use them more and more uh, on the road and near the roads, and uh, that's causing some problems. And we've had a few states in the, in the nation now allow ATVs on their roadways for, uh, for speeds of less than about 45 miles an hour. And I know uh, at least Alaska <laughs> is struggling. I, I, the, the DOT is struggling with that concept, how to be able to do that safely. So we're working on that as well. So we're, you're, as you go through the sessions, you'll see a diverse uh, number of, of uh, presentations uh, dealing with many of these issues. I hope you enjoy them. I hope you learn from them. And I hope it also spurs ideas for uh, further innovation and research in the future. Again, I'm really happy to see all of you here. And I hope we, I get to meet each and every one of you uh, sometime during the day. Thank you, Yen Hai. Thank you for inviting me to join you virtually to the uh, PAC Trans Regional Transportation Conference. I'm Rick Larson, and I represent Washington State's 2nd Congressional District, which runs uh, north of Seattle along Puget Sound uh, here in the northwest corner of the state. Since its inception in 2012, the PAC Trans Consortium has been at the forefront of transportation research, education, and workforce development in the Pacific Northwest. PACTRANS brings together some of the brightest minds from the University of Washington, Washington State University, Gonzaga University, Oregon State University, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, the University of Idaho, and Boise State University. I'm glad to say that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act invests $95 million over five years in the University Transportation Centers Program, placing an emphasis on resilience and leveraging resources and the demonstrated successes of UTCs in all Department of Transportation transportation initiatives. This funding supports your critical work to use technological advances to develop data-driven, sustainable solutions for the diverse transportation needs of the Pacific Northwest, including the mobility needs of underserved populations and increased bike and pedestrian safety, among others. Those needs continue to grow with roads, bridges, and highways becoming more congested. According to the Texas A&M's 2021 Urban Mobility Scorecard, traffic congestion before the pandemic caused U.S. drivers to waste 3.5 billion gallons of fuel, emit 36 million tons of greenhouse gases, and keep travelers stuck in their cars for 8.7 billion extra hours. That makes for a long commute. The abysmal state of our roads and highways is not all surprising given the American Society of Civil Engineers' latest infrastructure report card of 2021, which gave the U.S. infrastructure a C minus. And here in Washington State, the need for infrastructure investment is also acute. In 2019, again before the pandemic, the Association of Washington Business estimated that Washington State's infrastructure needs, need, uh, needs uh, are more than $222 billion dollars with highways local, and local roads alone requiring $146.5 billion of investment. From local exporters to aerospace manufacturers, to ferries, to the roads, bridges, ports, everything, all this, we need to move products to the market more efficiently. We have to have a better transportation network in our state because it has a direct impact on our economy. And the reality is that you cannot have a big league economy of little league infrastructure. And thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, our state is now making bold, long-term investments in multimodal transportation to keep people and the economy moving while pulling carbon emissions from transportation. For instance, next week, with the help of the infrastructure law funding, Community Transit will launch an on-demand ride service that will connect underserved residents of Linwood, Washington to nearby buses, recreational trails like the Interurban Trail, and soon, link light rail service. This investment will connect more people to school, jobs, housing, and more. And thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, states like our own state will be able to invest in safer roads, bridges, and tunnels. The US DOT recently announced Washington State is receiving more than $1 billion next year to support investment 
in roads and bridges, in carbon emission reduction, and in safety improvements. This, investments, this investment includes an increase in funding for the Highway Safety Improvement Program, which has supported improvements on roundabout projects across the country to tackle in inequities in the injuries and deaths among pedestrians and cyclists. Now, for instance, in Washington State, 24% of all traffic fatalities involved a pedestrian or cyclist last year. There's a clear need for investment in safety. And thanks to the IIJA, states are now required to spend at least 15% of highway safety improvement program funds on pedestrian and cyclist safety when cyclists and pedestrian fatalities are above 15% of all traffic fatalities. Equity requires deliberate and constant focus. And historically, transportation projects like interstate highways in urban areas were often built through predominantly black neighborhoods. And for this reason, the bipartisan infrastructure law establishes a $1 billion program to reconnect communities separated by these thoroughfares. However, under the, I, under the bipartisan infrastructure law, formula funding dwarves competitive grant dollars by a factor of about three to one. So it's imperative, therefore, that states and local policymakers and stakeholders commit to prioritizing investments equitably for communities most in need. It's also imperative for a well-functioning transportation network to have a diverse, well-trained workforce to keep people and the economy moving. And the bipartisan infrastructure law specifically includes my priorities to promote career opportunities and boost diversity in the U.S. transportation industry and establish clear apprenticeship goals to create a more diverse workforce. Without this workforce, the bipartisan infrastructure law will not be fully implemented and achieve its worthy policy goals. But I also understand government is certainly not the only sector where innovation needs to happen. Another way of looking at, at improving transportation networks, which many of you focus on, is using the data and communication intensive technologies to enhance network performance. Data analytics can and should be embraced, but we also need to be cognizant of unintended con consequences. For folks who write the algorithms these technologies rely on, you must ensure that you ask the right questions and accurately analyze data. Through data analytics, the U.S. transportation economy is evolving to keep pace with global competition. And the last thing I or anyone here wants for Congress is to stand in the way of that progress. So advancements in data analytics speak to how data-driven solutions are already revolutionizing safety and efficiency through transportation networks. Data will not only help to solve transportation challenges, but data-driven solutions can and must be part of an infrastructure strategy. So in conclusion, Congress must continue investing in transportation infrastructure and keep fostering innovation where, when it comes to transportation systems. Creating a sustainable and equitable transportation system that works for all users will not happen overnight. And that is why your work at PACTRANS and the other UTCs around the country are so critical. I look forward to working with all of you to build a cleaner, greener, safer, and more equitable transportation network. Thanks. Actually, at our kickoff event back to 2012, he actually was here in person and really uh, made a very nice speech and has been supporting us every time when we are up for competition. Um, now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor uh, Dan Sperling. Um, he's a, a Blue Planet Prize Professor, a distinguished Blue uh, Planet Prize Professor for Civil, uh, Civil and Environmental Science and the Policy, uh, Founding Director of the Institute of Transportation Studies, and the Founding Chair of the Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and Economy at UC Davis. He is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, in June 2013, he was named a recipient of the Blue Planet Prize from the Asahi Glass Foundation. The prize has been described as the Nobel Prize for the Environmental Sciences. He was recognized for his unique ability to bring together the top thinkers and the strategists in academia, government, and industry to develop new vehicle and a few policy approaches that are models for the world. 
he is recognized as a leader, an uh, internationally, uh, international, leading international expert on transportation technology, assessment, energy, and the environmental aspects of transportation and transportation policy. He has testified 10 times to the US Congress and the state legislatures and provided keynote presentations and the invited talks in recent years at international conferences in Asia, uh, Europe, and North America. In the past 25 years, he has authored or co-authored over 200 technical papers and 11 books, including Two Billion Cars, published by Oxford University Press in 2009. He has made 500 professional presentations in his career, including many keynote talks in the past few years. Um, Professor Spurling is very well recognized, so I can go on and on. There are a lot of things I could introduce, but I would prefer saving the time for him to give you the keynote speech. Then please come here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, you know, when you've been around for a lot of years, you start accumulating things. You get a lot of graduate students that help write lots of papers and books. So I am very appreciative of you know, my community of colleagues and students and friends. So I'm gonna take this conversation a, kind of a level above what your Congress member was, the way he was talking about it, and look at it in terms of the challenge of transforming transportation, because we are at a pivotal time in history for that. So actually, you notice there in my, in my uh, list of affiliations, uh, one other important one, and for 15 years, I've been holding the transportation seat on the California Air Resources Board, which is the government agency in California that oversees and manages climate change, climate policy, and air quality. And that's been quite a, a uh, education for a professor to be in that role. And I'm gonna come back to that in a, in a moment. So just a, a little brief uh, about my university, my institute. So I founded this institute over 30 years ago and one of the advantages of being around a long time, you actually get to influence the organization in your own vision. And it is, from the beginning, the focus has been on sustainable transportation. And when we started in the early 90s, no one was interested in sustainable transportation. Uh, and I was on a National Academy Committee for Transportation with Transportation Research Board, and we had to actually define what sustainable transportation meant. It took us two full days of discussions even to be able to do that. So anyway, we host the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, which is you know, here at University of Washington with your other centers. It's the regional center for the, for, uh, the federal region 10. And so we are the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. We do lots of stuff. We have uh, actually a very large international presence. I've, we've, just we've had a center in China for many years, and now we're, we've got a new center in Europe on transportation and climate, a new center in India, on more focus on electric vehicles, and a, and a major new initiative with Mexico, with the Mexican government. And all of this research, and it's something I want to emphasize, uh, being here with an academic and a public audience is, we need to be better on both sides of the aisle. We need researchers to be more engaged with the real world, to be doing research that really is useful and relevant, but we also need our partners to, to partner with us and understand we each have our own cultures, we each have our own incentive systems, and it's, it's not easy. So anyway, I can get into that in great detail and maybe in the Q&A we can do that if you're interested. So, you know, to frame what I'm going to talk about, we've created a transportation system that is what I call a car-centric monoculture. And it car-centric, that's pretty obvious what it means in monoculture because almost all of our travel 
for, for light duty uh, for passenger travel is by cars and light duty vehicles. And a very large percentage of it is with a single occupant. And this, this started back in, you know, in the, 90, you know, the Model T, really. It started in Los Angeles, really, where the city of Los Angeles was built around the car. Um, that spread to California, it spread to the rest of the US, spread to the rest of the world uh, to a large extent. And this is a system, this is a, a transportation system that is extraordinarily expensive, extraordinarily resource intensive. If you just look at some of the numbers, you know, how much we're spending, this is, these are numbers for the US, we're spending over $100 billion a year on road infrastructure. Each of us, you know, in terms of owning a car, it costs between five and, and nine thousand dollars on average to own own and operate a vehicle per year, per vehicle. You know, that's over a trillion dollars per year. We're spending a huge amount of money uh, on oil consumption, and you know, because of all of this oil we're we're consuming, we're having a huge impact on climate change. So. Um, that's kind of where we've ended up. So cars, light duty vehicles, motor vehicles have had a tremendous benefit, tremendous value to our society and to our economy. But I would argue we've gone too far. And now we have lots of options for moving beyond that. Now, the challenge, you know, when I say that though, I say that with some caution because in transportation, We've seen almost no systems innovation for over 50 years. And you could argue in some ways going all the way back to the Model T. You know, if you think about our vehicles, yes, our vehicles today are much better than they were, you know, even 20 or 30 years ago. They're safer, they're more comfortable, but functionally they haven't changed at all. They carry the same number of passengers, they travel at the same speed, They've got four wheels. So, and transit, you can say the same thing about as well. And I'm gonna focus mostly on passenger, even though I'm very interested in freight, but you know, we can come back and freight. You know, there has been a little bit more innovation. Containerization was really probably the big systems change in, in that sector, but even that was 50, 60, 70 years ago. So what's happened is, we've created a system that is not ready for innovation and change. Little innovations, incremental, kind of like the Congress member was talking about, yes. But in terms, I mean, we have a much bigger challenge here. You know, a climate challenge, an equity challenge, an economic challenge. And how are we going to address that? What are we going to do about it? And so our institutions, our transit operators, which are in really big trouble these days, um, they're just barely hanging on because of large subsidies from the federal government. Our, uh, um, our road system, which is still mostly based on cars, single occupants. Um, we need a lot of change. We need a lot of innovation. And there's opportunities for it. So just a, you know, kind of a little thread going through my talk that kind of you can keep in the back of your mind or maybe even the front of your mind is that, you know, we in academia, we have a responsibility, especially in public universities, but in academia generally. We have a social responsibility, a moral responsibility to make sure that our research is relevant and impactful. I mean, and this, I'm not saying anything that's surprising or shocking, even to academics. I mean, academics, no one wants to just write a paper that 10 people read and sits on the shelf. You know, that's not very rewarding. You know, we want, all academics want to have some impact. The challenge is how to actually make that happen. So, as I told you, 15 years ago, I got, uh, was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger to the California Research Sources Board, and that's really opened my eyes uh, to the opportunities and the needs for academia to, to work more closely with government 
and industry and NGOs and community groups. So, you know, it's easy to say this, um, and I'm happy to elaborate on it because, you know, we had a meeting yesterday at UC Davis where we've started this environmental justice fellowship program for individuals, activists, and others from community groups. And one of them, at, you know, asked the question, said, who's an, who's an activist? Who's an advocate? And, you know, all of us academics are sitting there saying, well, our job is not to be an advocate. Our job is to be a neutral, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, researchers that we take in the research and we just say what the, you know, report what the, the data says and the evidence says. And, but they were really pushing that. And so, you know, a lot of us, we do, we are at, at, a, at a minimum, we're advocates for more money for us, <laughs> right, <laughs> to Congress. So we're all advocates in some way, but how do we, I think in academia, we really have to struggle a little bit more about what exactly is our function within the larger societies. So anyway, that's what I do as a regulator. You know, I work with all of these, par all the car companies and oil companies. You know, we're trying to figure out, okay, what is, does science say in terms of adopting new policies and regulations? And if there's anything I've learned is that in academia, we think we know a lot. When I was appointed to this board, I thought, okay, I know 90% of what I need to know. This, this job is gonna be a piece of cake. Um, I turned out, it turned out I probably knew 20% of what I needed to know. And you know, I had to learn all kinds of legal rules, interstate, commerce, world trade rules, equity, not just for low-income disadvantaged communities and individuals, but equity between industries, between companies, between regions. It's really, I really gained a lot of sympathy for the politicians, by the way. It's, I mean, here they are. I thought, you know, I'm an expert in, in, in transportation and climate and air pollution, and that's what my job was, and I still, didn't know a fraction of what I needed to know. Here's a politician that's responsible for health, education, welfare, foreign policy, water, <laughs> infrastructure. I mean, how can they really make truly informed decisions? Okay, so that's me. So, okay. Um, so, kind of a way to frame these challenges for us in transportation. So I want to say, you know, I've worked in transportation, you know, 40 years or so, and I thought it was really exciting those first 30 years. And now looking back on it, it was kind of boring because compared to what's going on now, you know, transportation really has become the sexy topic because, you know, it's these revolutions that I talked about. So I wrote this book a few years ago called, you know, The Three Revolutions about electrification, and this is what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk a lot about electrification, but automation, vehicle automation, and sharing and pooling uh, as a third one. So you'll see as I talk about this, electrification is happening, it's done deal, you know, it's, there's a lot of challenges, but automation is a lot more uncertain exactly how fast and how it's gonna unfold, and pooling and sharing is kind of, that's where it comes in, this, this is really important, but it's even more uncertain how that's gonna happen. But it's probably the most important, and that along with electrification are the two most important variables or factors in, in creating a truly sustainable transportation system. Okay, so, um, uh, one of the points I'll make is we need to do all three of these. And really, if we bring these revolutions, these transformations together, it really create, it, it brings so much benefit to society, to, you know, to transportation, to society, to the economy. And, and you know, of course, safety, as a Congress member was talking about, is, is an important part of this, especially through the automation part of it, but it's economic, it's environment, it's, it's equity. So the first, that first revolution, this is, I'm gonna talk about it quite a bit because 
it is the most important transformation for the transportation sector to create truly sustainable transportation. If we're interested and concerned about climate change, if you look big picture about climate change, the, two most, the, the most important thing we need to do is shift to renewable electricity. And, but the second most is electrification of vehicles. And so that's where we are in the transportation sector. And for transportation, it's by far the most important thing we can do for climate change as well as air pollution uh, benefits. And the good news is we're on that path. There's no longer a question about whether we're going to electrify our transportation system. There's no question about it. The automobile industry, almost every major car company has said they will maybe do one more combustion engine model, but in many of them are saying not even that. By 2030, many, many of them are saying they'll be completely transforming to electrification. And by the way, when I say electrification, I mean uh, battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, which have a small combustion engine, and f hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles as well. So, you know, the industry is ready. It's got the supply chains in place. They have the technology. The battery costs have dropped dramatically. And, and we're seeing in all the major uh, markets in the world policies in place to make this happen. And there's kind of one exception, you know, half exception, and that is Washington, D.C. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll get to that in a moment. But, you know, and I'll show in a moment, California is now uh, on the path. Washington is pretty much aligned uh, with California the, uh, uh, on this, and many other states as well. China, so China has over 20% market share is electric vehicles now. And they're the largest market in the world. The European Union is getting close to 20% also. And, they're, and they have a mark, they're the second largest, well, the third largest market, depending on how you define them, in, in the US. And they are on this path also. They're about to adopt a regulation requiring 100% of sales to be zero emission by 2035. So the major markets are all auto markets and consumer markets are all uh, on board. And as I said, the automobile industry is completely on board. It's, for them, it's just a question of how fast uh, and exactly you know, some, the details of how it's going to be happening. And this is just some headlines. So um, really, the reason why I say this is a done deal and when I say it's a done deal, I don't mean it's going to be easy, that we know exactly how we're going to get there, but it's a done deal because it is going to happen one way or another in the near future. And the reason for this is this tremendous improvement in battery costs. And, you know, in, in the kind of energy area, we've seen a dramatic reduction in costs of solar energy, and now we're seeing a, a dramatic reduction in battery costs. So battery costs have come down almost, almost 90 percent since 2010. I mean, think about that. That is a massive, massive improvement and change. And it's, and those improve, there's a little blip now, you know, mineral costs and lithium and everything. <clears throat> costs are going up and there's all the uh, globalization and, and, and political, global political issues here associated with it. So there's a little blip, so the, probably the battery costs are going to stay constant, if flat for another year or two probably, but then they'll continue going down because there's so much investment going into batteries and so much R&D and there's so many opportunities for bringing those costs down. So we will see them coming down further. And so um, kind of a big um, political policy regulatory change is California uh, a month or two ago in August, uh, my agency, you know, it's my, I call it my moonlighting job. So I'm, I'm an academic. I've been an academic for 40 years, you know, that's how you not introduced me. I'm a professor, but I've also gotten involved in the policy side of this. And so um, 
and I, as I said, I hold the transportation seat on this board. So we adopted this rule requiring that all vehicles, light duty vehicles sold in California must be zero emission by 2035. It says one third, by 2026, one third must be zero emission. By, 20, by 2030, two thirds, 2035, 100%. And so these are the percentages year by year that we adopted. And Washington and Oregon and a lot of other states are following California's lead. So the way this works is that the US government, EPA, can adopt these emission standards. Um, but there was a special provision written into the law many years ago that said California could do its own standards as long as they're more stringent than the national. And, and any other state can follow either the US standards or the California standards. And over time, more and more states have been following California, which is more aggressive uh, than the feds. And we can talk about federal versus state policy if you're interested. I'm kind of setting you up for any, uh, in, inspiring you to ask any questions about any of this. So um, this is kind of, you know, I, when I do talks um, outside the U.S. and, you know, especially, you know, when it was during the Bush years and the Trump years, I always would start out my talk saying, I am from the nation state of California. <laughs> and uh, that would always, not only, actually the biggest applause I ever got was during the Bush years in Europe when I stood up and, and said that. Someone asked me some really antagonistic question about what the Bush administration US was doing. And I answered that way. I got a standing applause. <laughs> All right, so that's just kind of fun here. Anyway, so as I said, Europe and China are following closely behind, or not following, are on similar trajectories to California. Basically, both of them going towards 100% of zero emission vehicles by 2035, or something very close to it. And what I want to emphasize, when you listen to the politicians, they talk about, okay, if we're going to go, if we're going to, you know, reduce our greenhouse gases and decarbonize our economy and our society, it's going to be hugely expensive. And they talk about spending trillions of dollars. Well, that is not true for transportation. And that is because, in, in fact, it, okay, so it's not true for transportation. And that's because Electric vehicles, when you look at them as a total cost of owning and operating electric vehicles, um, they will soon be less costly than a gasoline vehicle and diesel trucks as well, you know, when you compare uh, comparable vehicles. And so what that translates to mean is that electric vehicles will soon be preferable on an economic basis for consumers and for the economy. And in fact, in many applications today, that's true already. And that's because the energy costs, the electricity costs, are much less than the gasoline costs, especially here in the Northwest, um, but almost everywhere. And the maintenance costs are much less because you have much fewer moving parts and there's much less maintenance needed for an electric vehicle. So this was an analysis that we did for the state of Calif the University of California uh, Institute of Transportation Studies. So there's four of us campuses. You know, we have Davis and, oh yeah, there's Berkeley too, and uh, Irvine and UCLA. And, but we did lead this study at Davis <laughs> um, for the state of California for the legislature and we showed, and this was two years ago, we showed that by 2030 taking into all the costs for electrification, and that included even hydrogen vehicles, which are more expensive initially, taking into account all the infrastructure costs that we would break even by 2030. And I think now we would make, you know, much sooner, you know, a couple of years sooner than that. And this is on average. so. This is an, you know, forget climate change, forget health. This makes sense from an economic perspective. And then of course you throw in the health benefits and the climate benefits and it's a no brainer. Okay, 
So, you know, then the questions, you know, arise, why do we need government intervention then if this is such a good economic deal? And for all the researchers in the crowd, as well as all of us as individual consumers, we know no one makes a decision based upon total cost of ownership. And we've done focus groups with, you know, with engineers, with financial managers. No one, <laughs> no one does this. A few do it like a really, you know, some engineers and financial people will do kind of a really sketchy thing. Um, I could tell lots of, I was actually with an Uber driver that had a Tesla uh, uh, last night coming here uh, in, in California. And she was talking, she leases the, the car and then she did, you know, and she said, what a great deal it is because she gets all, you know, how much money she makes. And then I started to ask her about how much she's paying for electricity because she's charging, she doesn't have a, uh, she doesn't have a house with its own charging. She goes to fast chargers, which are very expensive. And she really had no idea how much she was paying. And it was, it was more than the least cost for the vehicle. So anyway, just highlighting what we all know. And... You know, it's kind of, and, and we tend to be conservative. We, we think about resale value. We think about, you know, what is the future price of oil and gasoline going to be? And, you know, there's, from, for researchers, you know, we think about loss aversion and range anxiety. So we're going to need incentives for a long time. Um, but incentives, this is very important. Some incentives are much better than others. Like just a simple thing is, if you give the incentive at the point of purchase, when the per person walks into the dealer and paying, that's worth probably roughly three times as much as if you get a check in the mail later, or you know, even worse, you do it through tax credits, um, you know, income tax credits later on. But even better than that is a concept called fee baits, where you can make this revenue neutral so there's no cost to government, no cost to taxpayers. And what happens is if you buy a gasoline car, you pay a fee. If you buy an electric car, you get a rebate and you design it so that it's revenue neutral. So those of you that have any influence here in Washington, go talk to your legislators. I mean, it's a no-brainer idea. It makes so much sense. Uh, Euro several European countries have already done it. I'm working on California, um, but, you know, haven't succeeded yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> See, that's where you get into this issue about advocacy. <laughs> where is the boundary? <laughs> okay, we, we can, I'll, if anyone wants to talk about that. I'm, so. Okay, so what we've learned is that for the electrification, the most important policy by far are these ZEV mandates or a comparable policy would be a aggressive uh, performance standard, um, a CO2 or greenhouse gas performance standard. And that's what Europe is doing. They're not doing a ZEV mandate, but they're doing a very aggressive performance standard, a CO2 a performance standard, so aggressive that car companies have to use electric vehicles to meet that requirement. So it's kind of comparable. So the idea is, Really, these policies that tell the car companies they have to do it is really the most important. And, and I say that with a little humility because I believe very strongly in market-based approaches, performance-based approaches. That is the way, that should be the, the most, you know, the preferable way, the first principle way of adopting policy. But this is a special case where I said the industry is ready, they're a little risk-averse, but they've got the technology, the benefits are huge, let's just move on. And actually, when we passed this regulation in California two months ago, there was so little opposition to it. Not a single car company told us, this is a dumb idea, don't do it. Not a single car, they quibbled a little bit about some of the details, you know, we put in lots of rules about warranties that they had to impose. And, and some other small things. Tesla didn't like the idea that we were gonna require that every car sold had to have a charge cable in the trunk, and they saw it, thought it was unnecessary. Um, but basically, no opposition, no opposition. So the industry, they're on board, and, and they're gonna do this. Now, okay, I'm gonna digress, I'll tell a little anecdote. So here in Washington, 
you know, is a little bit, the politics are a little bit like California, but there's a lot of those, you know, so-called red states. So I did an interview, you know, right after California adopted the standards, I, I did an interview on Fox News um, about it. And then a couple days later, I did a, basically the same interview, said basically the same things on PBS NewsHour. So Fox News, you know, conservative audience, PBS, more liberal audience. After the Fox News, I got a torrent of hate mail. <laughs> the nicest thing anyone said was I was an idiot. <laughs> and it went downhill from there. After the PBS one, I was told I was a, their champion, their hero. Not a single negative or even neutral email did I receive. So this is, you know, so we're seeing even electric vehicles are getting politicized, which is a really unfortunate. Uh, and it's really one of the reasons why it's, gonna, it's harder and slower in Washington, D.C. to get change. But states like California, Washington, Oregon, and a lot of other states are moving forward and, and can move forward politically. All right. So it's not just cars. So California actually two years ago adopted very similar ZEV mandate for trucks, medium and heavy duty trucks, including long haul tractor, uh, uh, tractor trailer trucks. And so these are the numbers that we adopted two years ago, but we're about to adopt new rules that say by 2040, every truck sold in California must be zero emission. Every truck, including those big long haul trucks. And, you know, I you know a lot of other states uh, hopefully will be following. I don't know if 2040 is the exact right time, but, you know, it is the right thing. And again, the economics really makes sense. You know, you see Amazon buying massive numbers of electric trucks for their delivery trucks. Why are they doing it? It makes economic sense um, as well as environmental. All right, so, you know, this is just a list of policy agenda. I'm going to leave these slides so, you, you know, anyone interested in it will be able to access them, right? These will be available. Uh, okay, so there's lots of things that, you know, charging infrastructure is a really big important also. Um, although I'm doing a lot of work with uh, Europe and Korea and China, and, you know, there the charging and public charging infrastructure is a, much bigger priority because, you know, in the U.S., most of the buyers of electric vehicles have their own homes, you know, initially at least, and can charge at home. You know, we're finding in our research, so I have a big EV research center within my institute, um, probably the biggest center in the world, and, you know, we're finding 85 to 90 percent of all the charging is done at home. So, um, you know, it's less of a challenge initially. I mean, as we get deeper into the market, the public charging is going to be important. But in places like Europe and China and, you know, a lot of like Korea, a lot of places where more people live in apartment buildings and townhouses, it's a much bigger challenge and a much more important priority. Okay, and then that second, so that was my, I'm going to do a much shorter focus on the next two revolutions, automated vehicles. I mean, I think that automated vehicles will eventually dominate. And it's going to take a lot longer. It's a little unclear how it's going to happen. Um, but it is something, it provides, it potentially provides a lot of benefits. And I'll talk about that in a second. And so, but there's many challenges with these vehicles. I mean, it comes down partly to um, safety because that's the first barrier. And when we look at automated vehicles and we evaluate them and, you know, we say, is, are they safer than, you know, human drivers? And, you know, on average, they're probably already safer because humans, they drink, they fall asleep, they text. You know, robots don't do that. <laughs> so they have some other, you know, shortcomings. Um, you know, a good driver, alert, you know, and so on is, is probably always going to be better, or at least for a very, very long time. Um, but we hold these automated vehicle technologies to a very high level 
very high threshold. And the fact that there's major corporations doing it makes us even more, we as a society, even more skeptical and more demanding uh, of them. So there are lots of challenges. Um, and happy to go into some of them, but I want to move on to the third question, you know, this third revolution, and that is really it's a question about sharing and sharing and pooling rides. And, you know, it, the pandemic didn't help. So people have become more concerned about being in close proximity to others, um, they're riding, you know, transit, I said transit's in big trouble everywhere, you know, transit on average in the U.S. is about 30% where it was before the pandemic and, and before it was, had been in steady decline across the country for, you know, for a decade, so it was already declining. Actually, Seattle has one of, been one of the bright spots in terms of transit. But even on average, transit in the U.S. account, before the pandemic, accounted for about 2% of, tra of travel, passenger travel. Now it's probably closer to, you know, 1.5% or even less. A tiny, tiny percentage. So transit, conventional legacy transit plays a huge role um, in transportation for downtowns of cities, you know, where there's very dense corridors but overall it plays a very small role. And so that's part of it. So we have a transportation system. You know, this car-centric transportation system has marginalized a big chunk of our population. It's people that are economically limited, physically limited. Uh, and if you think about it, even people, households that have cars, you know, lo you know, they often have one car for multiple drivers. The cars are older, not so reliable. And if you think, you know, do the analysis, I'm trying to get my researchers to actually nail down a number, but I think it's like 15, you know, you could say 15 to 20% of our population has been marginalized by this car-centric, having a car-centric transportation system. That's massive. So anyway, um, the question is, will, they be, will these new vehicles be shared or will they like run by mobility companies like a Uber or Lyft type company, or will they be individually owned? And if they're individually owned, that is, um, I won't call it quite a disaster, but it certainly does not contribute to creating a more sustainable transportation system. So this is a study that was done uh, at UC Davis and UC Berkeley where we actually gave a chauffeur to people for a few weeks to simulate having an automated vehicle and how did their travel behavior change? Dramatic increase in driving. And this is intuitive because think about it, if your car can, can be a hotel room, a bedroom, an office, entertainment complex, you know, you don't care so much if it takes two or three hours to get somewhere. Uh, you can live up in the mountains and, you know, I don't know exactly the geography, how far away is Whistler <laughs> from here or uh, a good ski area. So, you know, and then you're gonna have zero occupant uh, trips because people, you know, they'll go and come into Seattle and they say, well, I don't wanna pay that cost of parking and just send the, trip, the car back home and then, and then beckon it back a few hours later um, without an occupant. So if it's individually owned, we're gonna see a huge increase in vehicle, VMT vehicle use. Um, and part of what's gonna, but part of what's gonna go on here is the question is if they're pooled and shared, then the cost per passenger mile goes down a lot. And okay, I can see I've been having too much fun talking here. <laughs> so this is why my, I personally, from all my research, I've written books, actually I'm helping lead a, an NSF center, uh, National Science Foundation Center of Automated Vehicles. Uh, Cynthia Chen, Professor Chen is participating from UW. Uh, and all the research I've done, everything I know tells me that if we truly want a sustainable transportation system. Number one, vehicles electrified. Number two, shared automated vehicles. 
and that's we bring down the cost of transportation, we make it accessible to a lot more people um, that don't normally have access to their own car, can't drive, or for whatever reason. And we're freeing up a lot of space, all the parking space. You know, we devote, cities typically have 40% of their space devoted to parking and, and roads. I mean, think about that. So it can reduce that significantly. Okay, so, you know, I made this sound all easy, but it's not so easy. It is going to be very disruptive, disruptive to industry, all these industry groups to um, going forward. It's going to have disruption for jobs. It's not necessarily negative for jobs, net negative. In fact, I think it'll be net positive, but it'll be very disruptive, and so you get into the high road job issue. And so um, kind of a closing thought is that we really need a new mindset you know, for thinking about the future in transportation. And it's for leader, you know, for our political government leaders, but also for us researchers, because it's our role to provide the research foundation for these decisions that need to be made going forward. And so, as I say here, you know, the tendency is always to focus on the negatives. You know, Uber disrupts traffic and causes pollution in cities, and scooters and so on. You know, all the things we've gone through in the last few years. But, you know, these are the foot in the door. These are the essential, essential building blocks for creating this more sustainable system. And we need to be thinking about that. Okay, and so um, with all that, I just, you know, the, the, the challenge I present to all of us is that how do we think about these changes, which are, you know, they're coming to transportation, they're already here. By the way, the, the pivotal time in history for transportation was about 2010. That's when we first started bringing out electric vehicles, that's when Uber and Lyft got started. That's when Google first unveiled its first automated car and made automation a big, big deal. So we are at the very beginning of this transformation. And all of us, in government, NGOs, academia, have a big role to play in this. And all of us need to be really focused on this if we're going to make this happen in a, in a good way. And good, I mean, in the public interest. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Pemeril. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, with California and CARB uh, has uh, the 2030 timeline for 100% uh, ZEVs. 2035. And 2030, oh, yeah, well, you got I'm getting ahead of my question. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I saw articles at that point in time a couple months ago that Washington is following the lead. You now explain that. They have a choice of following the states or the federal. California has got the, it, it, you can, we can follow that here. But it's my understanding, uh, several months before that, Washington is now 2030 for 100% ZEV. So I'm wondering when California is going to follow their lead. <laughs> <laughs> well, un, in this case, unfortunately, Washington cannot do what it wants. <laughs> uh, oh. And, and the 2030, you know, the, uh, lots of governments have talked about, you know, 2030 this or that. Um, most of these proclamations are aspirational. Yes. Um, they're not embedded in actual, codified in actual laws and rules. Um, but well, anyway, if I were to say that uh, by tw in within five years, California might be at 2030 for that 100 percent, and by then probably Washington will be at 20, 2028 for that. Uh, would you disagree? Well, I will say this is just these are the regulations. The market can go faster. So yeah, because I mean, when you get back to the uh, EV adoption through the, you know, the the cost of the battery per kilowatt hours, well, I'd probably at 100 now. It might be less, you know, given what you said in two or three, four years. Um, that's what we're going to see. Is the market is going to lead that, and then the states will catch up. It could be. You know, Norway is at you know something like 80 percent already. Yeah. So, you know, for a particular region. Or a state like Washington, yeah, you know, Washington could go faster. Okay, well, I hope that California catches up with us. Okay, and we're cheering you on. 
Okay, Dr. Sperling, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. Um, my name is Kai Jinho from Oregon State University. Uh, my question is also related with the, uh, the adoption trajectory that you showed er you know, earlier, 2035. And the question is on the supporting infrastructure you know, to, for that. You know, for example, the, the current power grid. And there's a lot of debates in terms of are the current power grid you know, are ready or what type of evolution, you know, revolution or transformation needs to be going through to support that adoption. Uh, and the other, you know, a lot of the debates in terms of with, you know, electric vehicle being greener, and, but the generation of that electricity and if that generation of the electricity is green enough. And so a lot of the debates in terms of you know, the, that, that portion, uh, the environmental impact of the power generation. And you talked a lot about politics and also um, you know, policy, making policy. And last the question, you know, I just, uh, um, why the current the Biden administration are you know, kind of hesitating or um, unwilling to recognize Tesla being the leader, the, act, you know, the dominant leader in the U.S. market. Uh, I wonder if you have any insight. The, Thank what, you. That the U.S. is the leading market for what? Uh, the Tesla being the leading, you know. The, oh, Tesla. Yeah, being the EV leader yeah. in, the, in, in, in the U.S. and also, I think, you know, globally as well. Thank yeah. you. You know, the Biden administration is really, they have a lot of challenges. You know, they don't know whether they want more oil or less oil. They don't know whether how to deal with jobs and labors because, you know, the, the Tesla is not unionized. And, you know, so there's lots of, you know, at, at that level, there's th those issues. You know, Tesla is two thirds of the market. But the answer to your first question about the electric, the grid, okay, so I'm not um, a grid expert, but um, it is going to take time. And, but what I've learned in my, you know, role in government and policy is that. You need to put a stake in the ground. You need to have an aggressive uh, goal, a believable one, and you put that in because, in this case, both on the transportation side and the electricity side, there's a lot of entities that ha are needed to make this work. You know, the utilities, you know, the local governments with permitting, uh, you know, the auto industry, and so on. And so, for you know, all of these to happen. There has to be an alignment. So if you put that stake in the ground, it gets everyone's attention, and it means they start figuring out what they need to do to play their role. And it's the same on the electricity side. And, and so it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be hard. And you know what? I shouldn't say this publicly. Maybe we won't hit 100% in 2035. Uh, maybe we'll do it sooner. I doubt it. But, you know, Maybe we won't hit 100%, but we'll get close. And, it's be, and, if you, and if you, we said the goal was 70% in 2035, you know, it wouldn't get the same attention. So that's, that's kind of not very scientific, but um, it's what I've learned. <laughs> Thank you.